Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. At Sterling Structural Therapy, we use a, an innovative, completely non-invasive approach to the treatment of orthopedic and chronic pain conditions. And one of the things that makes this method unique, one of the factors, is that it is a fascia-based approach. Another word for fascia is, another term for it, is connective tissue. Today, I'm going to tell you, give you a brief synopsis of what is this fascia thing that you might have already been hearing about a little bit in the media. I'm also going to give you a very clear, concrete, visual demonstration of how fascia is affecting every single one of you right now just sitting here, and also when you're on the golf course, at the gym, or even if you're just trying to put your uh, bag in the overhead bin on the airplane. So whenever we introduce a new concept, and fascia is a brand new concept in medicine and rehabilitation. It's only about seven to 10 years old, the research on this. It's really important that we actually connect it to what we already know to get a better understanding. So let's start with two anatomical systems we're all really, really familiar with. So the first system, we all have seen this at one point or another, the skeletal system, and if you need to tune up to your skeletal system, you book an appointment with Dr. Rob. And then the next anatomical system, again, I doubt there's anyone in the room that doesn't know it or won't recognize it, the muscular system. And for tune-ups on this system, you go see our friends at the exercise coach and go get some testing done in Cerulean to figure out what exactly to do with this. Now, this is sometimes, those two systems will sometimes be called the musculoskeletal system. I'm about to tell you about a third system, a massive one, that actually connects those two to each other. And this system has been summarily ignored in rehabilitation and medicine actually for hundreds of years. So how it's been ignored is that the way we study anatomy to understand how to better help people recover is through cadaver dissection. And for hundreds of years, when we are doing cadaver dissection, we have simply been cutting away this fascia connective tissue and literally throwing it in the garbage bin. So when I went to college, which was not hundreds of years ago, but a little while ago, um, same thing. We were just taught to cut it away so you can look and study the muscle and look and study the bone, look at the attachment and origin. We were actually taught that fascia is simply packing material. And we're not an Amazon packet, <laughs> okay? We are brilliantly designed. Everything in there is for a reason. What we're finding out, like those two blue diagrams that you see behind me, not only does fascia matter, but it has very specific lines of pull. And if you could look at those two diagrams, can you imagine if someone has a fascia restriction through this that will alter their muscles and their bone positions, that they, their posture might change, and then their range of motion, and maybe they'll develop some issues based on this. Now, the image in the center is very useful because I want you to think as your fascia as your birthday suit. <laughs> it's the organ of form. And those two images on the side is actually fascia when magnified times 25. It looks like cobwebs. So it's literally the cobwebs that make you who you are. Now, fascia is an interesting thing. And another reason that it's been summarily ignored even in modern day medicine is guess what? Fascia does not show up in MRIs, X-rays, or CT scans. So imagine someone's having an issue and they're getting some imaging done, and I'm not gonna argue that their images are showing possible stenosis, bone on bone, etc. That is true, but there's another big piece of the puzzle that's simply being ignored. Can you imagine getting a diagnosis and treatment based on seriously incomplete data? That, it does not sound like a good equation, does it? Now, some other fun fascia facts. Fascia has six to 10 times more sensory nerves than muscle. If you've ever had really, really bad muscle soreness after a serious workout, I mean, the next two days, you're kind of walking funny. This is some pretty high level pain, right? But the good news is, A, that's actually healthy, it's adaptation, and it goes away. 
Can you imagine that pain magnified times six or 10 times? And how about it doesn't go away, hence chronic. And if anyone in this room has ever had their back go out on them, their knee buckle, their neck go out on them, you know exactly what kind of pain I'm talking about. And some people that we work with, they're walking in, how long has this been going on? Three months, six months, a year, three years, and very often and sadly so, two decades, three decades, oh, let me think about it. So the good news is that fascia can give people like that a way out. And right now, I'm going to give you that visual demonstration that I promised in order to make sense of all of this so you can understand how it's affecting you right now. So allow me to introduce my colleague, Cody Williams, who is a structural therapist at Sterling Structural Therapy. But today, good, please giggle and whistle for the love of, yes, good. For today, Cody is Monsieur Fascia, okay? And I'm going to torture him and give him all sorts of fascia restrictions. Uh, now, before I do, Cody's fascia suit is healthy. And notice the cobwebs, right? They're doing well, right? So he can lift his arms, he can move, he can go hike, um, he can go play tennis, he can, do it, he can tie his shoes, no pain, okay? No problem. I'm about to change that. So I'm going to give Cody a myofascial restriction at his right rib cage and armpit. And if you can already see, he's already having to adapt a little bit against this. Good. So now, Cody, go ahead and try to lift both arms up for me. And we're going to just, woo, good. Okay. So can you see that his range of motion is restricted, restricted right now? Really try to lift them up higher, Cody. Okay. Now, drop them back down because, ow, that's not fun. Now. This makes sense, right? You can imagine how this is going to create this restriction. Did you notice what happened at his left shoulder over here? Uh-huh, yeah? So go ahead, lift both of them again. A fascial restriction here is causing some serious range of motion issues over here. Now let's drop that down, and I'm going to give him a fascial release and fix him up, and now, woohoo, yeah. Did you notice him kind of move his neck? That can, is not comfortable in the neck either. Just going to give you a brief example, a client that came to see us, Fully torn rotator cuff. The surgeon said, sorry, can't repair it. Fully torn. She now has that full range of motion and no more pain because we actually helped her modify her fascial restriction and she changed certain habits to not recreate it. So it's actually incredibly adaptive. Okay? Your body is incredibly adaptive. It does not rely on just one small little muscle and there are even four little rotator cuff muscles if you create balance elsewhere. I'm gonna give another example, torture Cody some more. And this is a bit more of a complex example. So I'm gonna give Cody a pretty severe myofascial restriction at his right hip. Good. Now, first of all, can you see how Cody has started to kind of develop some interesting posture? Good, Cody, try to lift your arms for me, please. See where the restriction is? It's even worse than before, by the way. Did you notice that? And then drop the arms back down. Now, Cody's going to attempt to walk with this myofascial restriction. So we're going to go for a little walk. And he's going to walk a little bit interestingly, right? Okay? okay and we're going to back it up so we don't fall on Dr. Rob. Good? Okay? So what I want you to see is that, first of all, you already saw how this affects his shoulders. Think about his neck. Can you imagine what might be happening at this hip over here? how that might be compensating and actually wearing on things, maybe even wearing cartilage from the position. Of course, this hip is probably not very happy and this knee could have serious problems. With this pattern, Cody can have plantar fasciitis on his left foot because it has to deal with severe loads and modified impact with every step to try to stabilize him. This is the interesting with fascia, where you think it is, it ain't, okay? And the other point is, can you imagine his lumbar spine? I dare anyone to go for a walk with this. Half an hour. Tell me how your back feels. Okay. So I'll set Cody free, proverbially and literally. Thank you, Cody. Everybody, please give him a hand for being tortured. Okay. And now I'm going to give you that real-life example. It's actually my privilege to share the story of one of our amazing, courageous clients and their journey to recovery. Samantha's story. By the time Samantha came to see us, these are the surgical procedures that she had gone through. It started out with double scopes on each knee. Didn't work. They did a release of the ligaments on the outside of her knees. 
Couple of years later, she ended up with low back pain. They did lumbar spine surgery, a discectomy. Couple years later, Samantha ended up with severe debilitating neck pain. I'm seeing some faces that, yeah, it's not pretty, yeah? Okay, and what they did this time is they put this hardware in her neck. Okay, so they did an, uh, just trying to help her, yes? They did an anterior cervical fusion. They fused her neck. So by the time she was sitting in front of us, she was literally immobile. She was pale gray, could be very shallow breathing, uh, could not do any of the things she loved to do, and relied on opiates daily simply to cope. And I like this example because if anyone should be like a, an end game, it's Samantha, right? Like, this is it. Like, okay, uh, let's change the meds maybe. Find different ways of coping with this. Well, I'm here to tell you that's not what happened. That's Samantha today. That is a year and eight months after starting treatment. Through a heck of a lot of diligent work, investment in herself, time, money, energy, and she still does daily homework exercises absolutely necessary to sustain and actually to increase the trajectory of her uh, mobility, yes? She's back today to national level competitive horse training. The point of my story is, if anyone tells you it's too late and you even have the MRIs and x-rays that say so, don't believe it. Thank you.